<laughs> Hi everyone, just want to introduce you to David Tebbett, known affectionately as Tebo to his friends and colleagues. Uh, David is a, has been a journalist um, and an analyst probably for longer than I've been alive um, and started off his career selling newspapers on the streets of Paris. God blimey, there's a memory for you. This is Alison. Alison's a PR whiz. She's Marcom's whiz. In fact, she's just generally a communications whiz. Um, she claims, and with some justification, that she used to be an 80s disco queen. Oh, and in her, she's beaten me to it. And in her head, she still is. <laughs> Thank you, Alison. A lot of people say, why should we talk to the press? Um, why don't we just talk to people directly? Well, first of all, you can't reach them. Uh, the press has got the reach. But more importantly, um, your stakeholders, the people who want to know what you're up to, are more likely to believe the press. So, the press has to write about you, but without your expertise, they can't write about you. So this is where you come into the picture. You talk to the press, the press writes about you, your stakeholders get the message, bang, bang. Okay, this, that's what this is all about now. So Addison's going to ask me a whole bunch of questions, God knows what, but uh, I'll do my best to answer them. So what do you want from a spokesperson? Or more importantly, what do you uh, not want? Well, I don't want the same. Uh, the same is horrible. Oh, I see you've just written about this. I do that. Would you like to write about me as well? No, thank you very much. Um, if it's a news story, it's got to be new. That's why it's called news. It's got to be a disclosure, ideally. Or the journalist has got to think it's a disclosure. Um, so we don't want the same. And even a feature writer doesn't want the same. But if you can give them an angle on something, fine. Different angle, different point of view, lovely. We don't want corporate crap. Sorry, I'm not allowed to say crap. I just said it. Um, we don't want people hiding behind corporate coattails. We don't want people saying, it is corporate policy, our mission is too. Or even, we're very excited by it. Because you're not. You're just being paid to be excited. So forget all that rubbish. You know, be you, be yourself. Um, what else? Bland, bland, bland pap. We don't want bland pap. We want something interesting. We want stories. We want anecdotes. We want excitement. We want you to be enthusiastic, please. Okay. Okay. So what about the tricks that journalists use to trap spokespeople and saying things they don't want to say? Well, bah, as if. Yeah, all right. I confess, we do play tricks. If we're not getting what we want, if we think we're getting a disclosure, fantastic. But if we're not getting what we want, we'll play tricks on you. We, we might be aggressive, we might interrupt you, we might ask you lots of questions so that your brain just melts and you start saying whatever you're thinking. That's not very nice, but that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is that we might insult you. Another way of doing it is we might praise you. We don't care. We will use whatever we think works for you. And then we sit back and we wait for you to cough. And if you fail to cough, then we have a problem. Now, how do you cough in a way that the journalist is going to like it? Well, the answer is you have some messages in your head. You already know what is going to interest their readers. So why not say it? Why not have something in mind that's going to interest the readers and prove it, provide a bit of evidence. And then whenever you're stuck with the journalist and you're feeling horrible, just say, hmm, I can't talk about that. But did you know we're doing this? Poof, and off you go. That too? Yeah. Right. So I've heard you talking about tricks. Can you go into a bit more detail? All right, I'll start with aggression. Pressure, we will try and pressure you, okay? We will try and accelerate you. Uh, we'll, we'll even insult you if we have to. And the idea is get you hot under the collar. So the first thing is know that you're feeling hot under the collar and then you can think, hmm, <laughs> this is a trick. What shall I do about it? Well, the answer is slow down. Listen to what they say. If you can't find a way of addressing whatever it is they've asked, say to them, well, I'm really sorry, that's not my territory, or even if I knew the answer to that, I couldn't possibly talk about it. I'm not sure that's a good one, but you could say it. Um, but what I think your readers would be interested in is, bup, 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 and off you go. What about the journalist who tries to undermine you? Your company, oh dear me, the results, oh, they are just laughable. All we want to do is get you depressed. And the more depressed we can make you, the more likely we think it is you're going to blurt. Well, blurt, 
but blurt something that you want to say, have your messages ready and blurt. Adapt them, obviously, to the needs of that particular readership. Um, what about the journalist who's being nice? Yeah, sometimes journalists are nice. My God, you seem to know everything. And you're sitting there, your chest is swelling with pride. Maybe not your chest, I don't know. I wish I hadn't said that. <laughs> <laughs> It's not. It is. That's what funny. do I do now? <laughs> Start again on the. Oh, not from the No, 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 but from that bit about. Um... So, we might try and make you feel good. We might say things like, my God, you seem to know everything about this subject. God, it's rare that we meet somebody so knowledgeable and your little chest swells with pride and the journalist has got you because there's every chance you'll give something away, but you don't. Your chest swells with pride and you say exactly what you wanted to say and the journalist is fooled and they write it down and away you go. Will that do? Yeah, certainly will. So what about that old trick you do with business cards? Like get them. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, the old trick that Alison's referring to is that we get your mobile phone number, whether it comes off a business card or by other some other sub, subterfuge. Uh, if we got your mobile phone number and we know where you work, we can phone you up when you're in that traffic jam on the way to work in the morning, 20 to 8 or 20 to 9, or you know, we'll, we'll get the lie of the land. And we ring you up and we say, oh, Mr. Smith, I've forgotten how to spell your name. And you're thinking, hang on, this is a bit of a joke, isn't it? Is it, uh, the journalist says, no, is it S-M-Y-T-H-E? And you go, no, it's Smith. Now you're engaged. Now you're in a dialogue. And the journalist says, oh, before I go, there is just one thing I'd like to know. This is the danger point. Okay, you say, what is it? And the journalist says, blah, 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 whatever it is. And you say, well, I'd love to talk about that. Unfortunately, I've got somebody in the car with me at the moment. Or well, there's a policeman looking at me very suspiciously. Can I call you back? And you get their phone number. So you now know what the question is. Um, obviously, you've, you find out who the journalist is. And you get their phone number. Now. You can go to the office, you can call PR if you want to, and you can say, Oi, I've got this person, David Tebbett, he says. Uh, this is his phone number. Is he really a journalist? PR will check him out, and if it is, it is, and if it isn't, it isn't, and if it isn't, then it's probably a competitor snooping. If it is a journalist, you might say to PR, What do I say? And PR will say, Well, what do you want to say? And you tell them, and they say, Yeah, why not? Or maybe they say, Well, could you add a bit of proof, anecdotes, numbers, whatever. So away you go. You've got control, you've got power, you ring the journalist back and they are happy. So Honestly. where can people be caught off guard? Oh, business cards. Um, they can be caught off guard whenever they think they're off duty. Now, the trouble is a lot of people think they're off duty at a party, Christmas party, PR company runs it gets a load of clients in, gets a load of journalists in. The journalists all think victims. Uh, the victims all think party. Mm, lovely. So what I do at parties, I, I drink bitter lemon, uh, not bitter lemon, I, I drink <laughs> tonic water with lemon in and ice and I pretend it's gin. And of course the person next to me is matching me drink for drink and uh, not realizing that I haven't got any alcohol and uh, gradually they slide into oblivion confessing all on the way. Oh, that's just one. Um, um, like exhibitions, the worst places at exhibitions are on the exhibition stand, because we know you're on duty, you know you're on duty, so what's the point? And the press office, of course, that's the same thing. But if we go in the bar, you wonder why journalists go to bars? Well, that's the answer. We're more likely to get something out of you in a bar, or in a restaurant, or even in the hotel, than we are on the exhibition stand or in the press office. Where else? Airport departure lounge? That's a cracker, especially if it's business class. I mean, I reckon in my career, you know, 30 odd years, I've picked up at least six stories in airport departure lounges just by sitting near people and listening, ear wigging. And if they're doing it all in public, well, they're doing it all in public. My mate, oh, I won't mention his name, of course, no, but he was on an aeroplane once and he saw a confidential document between two major companies, uh, some kind of agreement between two major computer companies. So he took a photo over the man's shoulder of this confidential document that he was reading in a public place. 
My friend then read all the words and went back to his seat, wrote a story. When the plane got a few miles from Chicago, well, I say a few, 120 miles or so from Chicago, he borrowed the phone on, on, on board the plane. In those days, you went up the front and said, can I borrow the phone? And a satellite call was patched through to Computer Weekly and it became the front, front page story. And of course, these two com computer companies went absolutely berserk. And the editor said, well, I have a photo. So if you're in a public place, keep it, keep, keep the lid on it, yeah? Because there isn't anywhere, really. Wow. Well. Wow. Well, holidays, maybe. If you're on holiday, you could say, can we talk when we're back in the office? How about that? <laughs> Good stuff. Is it fair to say you can get a fairly good inkling about how well or not you're doing in an interview by the way a journalist behaves? Okay. If behaviour is moving a pen, then that's quite a good clue. Because if they're moving their pen, that means they're writing stuff in their notebook. Now, whether it's good or bad is another matter, but they are actually capturing your words. If it's a tape recorder, it's a little bit different because body language comes into play much more. They're not looking at their notebook, they're looking at you. They might smile, they might frown, and you can read what you like into that. But they might be playing tricks. They might be smiling a lot and nodding, and that's because you're spilling the beans. <laughs> you're, you're on a roll as far as they're concerned, so why should they be nasty to you? So, you, you, you know, you've got to think to yourself, why are they being nice to me? Is it because I'm giving them what they need? And, and if yes, which it probably is, is it something I'm supposed to be talking about? And if it isn't, then you've got a problem. You've got to deal with it. Okay. Is it any different with news or features journalists? Yes. Uh, news journalists are after something really snappy. They just want to go in, get something that's different, interesting, benefits the readers, all that kind of stuff, um, get the evidence, proof, maybe get a quote or two, and, and as soon as they've got all their questions answered, they've got it all packaged up in a nice little triangle. You, you might have heard of the Pyramid of News. Um, if you haven't, look it up. Um, it's an old it's an old thing, but j journalists do write in a pyramid, and, and so if you're delivering in a pyramid, and they're writing in a pyramid, when the editor finally looks at it and says, oh, this is taking up too much room, the sub-editor can chop it off from the back and it still all makes sense. So that's something you might want to think about, the way you deliver the point, the proof, expansion, finish. That's news. Feature writers, you might have multiple pyramids. So you do your first one and they go, hmm, very interesting. What about this? And you give them another one, uh, all based on different messages. And, and then they, oh, yeah, very good. So what about this? And if you wrap in quotes and anecdotes and all that kind of stuff, you're really fulfilling the needs of the feature writer. So if news, short, sharp, get out. Features, um, more expansive. If you've got a novice on your hands, you really need to get rid of them as quickly as possible. Um, you know, tell your story, make sure they've got it all in their notebooks. You may actually have to say to them, this is my point, here are my evidence points, or you don't actually say it like that, but you, you go through the evidence, um, any questions, answer their questions, and if they ask, as they probably will, something completely off the wall, say, that's a very interesting question. Um, it, it's not strictly something I've got time for at the moment. Perhaps we could set up a separate meeting. You wanted to send them out with just that pyramid, that just little story, all, all wrapped up, neatly packaged. Goodbye, Mr. Novice. So, knowing you, David, I know that you have a particular idea about spokespeople depending on their job titles. This is true. This is true, and even their ex-job titles, yeah. you know, because if somebody used to be a techie, it doesn't matter what their job title is now, sales, marketing, rhubarb, rhubarb, boss, I like bosses too. Um, if they're ex-techies, there's a very good chance that lurking inside their current job title is a techie and a truth teller, because that's what techies are, they're truth tellers. So we are very warmly disposed to techies and ex-techies, very warmly, I have to say that now. We're also warmly disposed towards bosses because when we write something and we quote a boss, you know, managing director of da da da, then the editor goes, "Ah, oh, good old Tebo, he's spoken to somebody important," and uh, this this helps your quote get into the story. And if your quote's in the story, there's every chance your picture will be in the story. And if you're quoting your picture in the story, there's every chance there's a good little bit of story all about you, dedicated to you. And it doesn't matter how much they cut the story this way and that, you're still in there. Now, the danger 
is that you might talk rubbish and we'll still quote you. So you want to be a little bit careful what you actually say to a journalist. If you, if you speak the truth and it's great and it's on message and all the rest of it, wonderful. And, and if you're off message, you're still going to get published. So that's bosses and techies. We've got levels of aversion. The, 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 the least aversion is towards salespeople because we think that salespeople know secrets. If they know secrets, we think we can get to their secrets. How do we do that? Because they're salespeople, you know, they're in control of everything. They've got barriers, they've got messages galore, things they use with customers. They've got every counter imaginable to every question a customer can ask. So what hope has a journalist got? Well, we appeal to their ego. We always say things like, so how's it going in your territory? And they always say, really good or fantastic or very well. It doesn't really matter. It will always be a positive. And the journalists will then say, so no problems at all then. And they might go, <laughs> we'll stay silent because salespeople hate silence. I mean, well, there's always one problem everywhere. Everybody's got a problem, silence. Well, when I say one problem, I mean, actually, we've got 15. <laughs> and off they go. And the next thing you know, they're telling you all about their problems. So we appeal to their ego, their show-offness, and then we use silence to get them up to one of their disclosures. That's salespeople. Marketing people, they've also got one of these barriers. This is built full of marketing messages. The trouble is, there's no knowledge behind that. That's our assumption. We could be wrong, yeah? If, if you're in a company where marketing actually means you've gone through the mill before you get the marketing job, you can just say, look, in our company, we have to know everything before we can even get into marketing. So how can I help you? The problem's gone. But our assumption, our working assumption is marketing are just full of messages. I could have said something else, but full of messages, that's fine. PR, we would never, ever, ever use PR as a spokesperson. If I wrote something PR spokesperson said, my editor would sack me. That would be the end, the end of my career. PR people have their uses, okay? They are a bridge. Fundamentally, they're a bridge. They know all the journalists and they know all of you. And, and, and so what the journalist tries to do is bypass them. This is why we like to get business cards or mobile numbers off people because we can actually phone you direct or maybe even email you direct. We'll do anything to try and bypass PR if we possibly can. And there's ways of dealing with that. You know, you say to the journalist, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you at the moment. Can I ring you back? And then you panic and ring up PR and decide what you're going to say, etc., etc. Right. But if we can't get a hold of you or you've given us the bums rush or whatever, we phone PR. I really need to talk to this guy. PR says, why? Who are you? Who are you writing for? What are you writing about? How long have you got? Who else are you talking to? They ask us all these horrible questions which we don't want to answer. But we have to. They're holding the door shut. We can't get through. So we give them the answers. Now they are well armed. They come through to you and they say, look, this is the score, blah, 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 blah. You discuss what might be a best line of attack. When you're ready, you ring the journalist. The journalist is so relieved that you've actually run back. They'll be nice to you. It's a miracle. The other way it'll happen is that you might go to PR and you might say, boy, have I got a story for the Financial Times. You're going to get the same treatment. PR's going to say to you, Okay, why do you think this should work for the Financial Times? Which section of the Financial Times are you talking about? What, pre what evidence have you got? What numbers have you got? What quotes have you got from real people, customers? Have you got permission? It goes on. They ask you all these bloody questions and then they say, leave it with me, because now they're armed and they go off to the editor or the journalist or whoever, lay out their pitch and, and whoever it is says, yeah, that's fine, I'm very happy to do that, but I would like to take this angle on it or I'd like to take that angle on it or make sure if they've got a quote that it's from a really senior person in a really large company and then I'll, I'll talk. So you go, the PR goes back to you and they say, look, this is the deal. You sort out what you've got to sort out, ring the journalist and away you go. You win. How about that? Excellent.